So here is a little bit of proof of pudding. As I'm watching and listening to my good friend Liz, I'm discovering that my gorgeous resume, <laughs> it is beautiful, it's a piece of art, is worth it. And you know, there's always a good side to bad things, uh, which is obviously because it supports this, I'm here with you today, but uh, that is not something that you hear on the open market. That the beautiful resumes that we shell out $350, 500 for are going to get us through because they absolutely Exactly. So why didn't I know that before you that I met you? You should have come into my life ten years ago. <laughs> Is the plans 
anywhere people have a designation that you're looking for are really um, effective places to post because it ensures that people that you're looking for are going to be looking at the job post. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many people see it. You want the right people to be seeing it. And um, various job boards, there's so many of them. I didn't make a list because I'm sure you all know. Probably the best one that I like to use is Indeed. It's free. Um, I worked for quite a large organization a couple years ago that did a lot of research on how people search for jobs. And all of you have probably done this. Um, they call it a grassroots search. Open up Google, type in the kind of work that you're looking for and the city that you're looking for work, and you're probably going to see a bunch of Indeed postings come up first. And so Indeed's a really, it's got a lot of reach, um, and it's a really great free tool. Um, the average posting time is about two weeks. For a really general kind of skill set, you might want to post for only a week um, or, or less than that, depending on how sure you're going to be that you're going to have the right candidate in that pool. But the harder to fill skill set roles, um, some engineering roles, the really, really technical roles are going to be open until you find the right candidate. Um, and what we're seeing a lot of, and Lee's kind of touched on it a little bit too, is um, post and pray often isn't enough anymore as a recruiter, as, as an organization. You can't just throw the job posting up and pray that the right person sees it and sends in their resume. We're seeing a lot more targeted recruitment using tools like LinkedIn. Um, you don't really so much see the headhunters anymore calling organizations who works in payroll and really trying to sneak in that way to find out, you know, to talk to payroll people. Uh, you're, you've got recruiters who use LinkedIn, type in skill set that they're looking for, and a bunch of candidates pop up. So if you're a job seeker, a LinkedIn profile is something that I would highly, highly recommend. We don't see it so much right now because of the um, the economy in Calgary, but uh, you, you see it, you, we're seeing it a lot more than we ever used to. So the next step is resume screening. Excuse me, mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, it's been heard that uh, in mo most of the companies post the jobs, but actually they are not, they're not having those jobs in fact. Because they just did it because they have to do it because of the policies or the procedure, they must have to upload these are the jobs in our company. But actually, they doesn't exist, or maybe they are already filled internally. Right. I'm just asking. Right. Because so, it's always and, and that does happen. Um, I did. I worked at Suncor for for a, a year, and we had to post all positions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even if we did have an internal candidate, we had to post it. Um, and, and, and sometimes they, um, you see organizations do that um, because they're trying to get a certain employee um, Canadian status. You know, there's lots of different things um, and rules around that. I mean, if they've already got an internal candidate and, and you don't know that, there's, there's not really anything that you can do. Um, a, a good thing, especially if they have an ETS, is to apply anyway because then your resume will be on file. But, I mean, if, if they're doing that, it's too bad because they're engaging all of these candidates who are looking for jobs, but there's not really any way around that. Yeah? Yeah, I, I have heard that too. I've had that experience. There was a job at the library, I love the library, and I wanted it, and I like so wanted that job. Um, and I applied for it, and I was a great fit, I did my networking, I didn't hear a thing. What happened? I not hear a thing for this position? Well, I found out that internally they had changed their minds and they had shifted things around. I thought, well, they should have called. Like, <laughs> 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 well, the chief was wondering if they had a hundred people applying for that job. But it's, yeah, the behind the scenes yeah. is like things can change. So, but what if you don't apply? Like, you don't know. You just don't know. How long do you keep it on the That depends. Um, I would say you generally see about a year, um, six months to a year. Um, there's some legislation in PEPIDA, but it's not clear for organizations on how long to keep it. So a reasonable amount of time. Um, I would say that unless you're applying directly for a role, especially in an ETS, you're best bet and your, your best chance of getting that role is when you apply directly for when it's posted. There's not a lot of, or from what I've seen anyways in my background, there, you don't spend a lot of time 
on engaging the database of what uh, of resumes that we do have. Um, because if it's six months ago, we don't even know if those people are still available. We don't know if they're still looking. And so if you, if you work at an organization that has reach, um, recency is, is, is a really great thing. Post the job again. Um, because then you get a fresh batch of candidates. And, and you get those people who are available. Now, if you see a really great resume of a candidate, you can reach out to them. Um, but the likelihood of them still looking six months later right now is really different. But one more quick question. Mm -hmm. Someone had told me that people who are employed already mm -hmm. have a higher chance of getting a job than somebody who's not employed. I would disagree with that. Uh, and I mean, it depends on your recruiter or your hiring manager and if they have any kind of bias. Um, right now, I would say absolutely not because you're in good company in, in Calgary if, if you have been laid off. Um, if there's a huge gap, then I would have questions. But I think that most recruiters understand and are aware of the situation. So if somebody's been employed for, or unemployed for six months or three months or a year, um, but if it's been five years, then I would have some questions on why that gap is there. No problem. Some recruiters wait until the posting closes and then they do it. 
but if, if sooner that you're getting looked at, the better. No problem. Did you have a question? No, okay. I was just going to say the exact same thing. Okay. There'd be the 30 year old may not be true. Right. So there's just no answer. Right. But yeah. all of your best practice would always be to apply to your response. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So back to this now the screening. Depending on the level of the role, I mean, you can get for an admin posting that I did uh, last month, we got 800 um, residents. Did I look at every single one? No. Um, we got up to our, we got six or seven really strong candidates with, and, and we, we proceeded to interview from that. I think I have 650 unread um, resumes in there. But sort of the nature of the market at this point. Um, there's not, recruiters just don't have time to be going through 500, 1,000 resumes for every single role that, that they're applying for. That's, a, that's an administrative role. We wouldn't see that with a more specialized technical role, but, but uh, yeah. Um, I, I generally start by sorting them into yes or no's, taking my job profile that I have, comparing it to the resume, and is this, is this candidate, do they have the general things that we're asking for? Yes, could they be? Stronger probably, but I'll screen them into the yes for now. And when we when I get to the end, or when we get closer to doing pre-screens, then I'll I'll screen them again. Um, some recruiters like to sort them into ABCs, whatever. At the end of the day, you're really being sorted into a yes or a no, um, and that could be through an ATS, or it could be by a person through a recruiter's uh, email address. Um, and as we spoke extensively about, uh, ETSs have the capability to rank those candidates. So you want to be um, personalizing your resume as much as possible, customizing it to that particular position. So, mm -hmm. how did you do the first time? Right. So that looks a little interesting um, because really what you're looking for is somebody who has an interest in the job and the organization and not just wants a job or wants a job with say sign for let's use that as an example, right? So if somebody's applying to an HR job and a communications job and a field operator job and a job in Fort McMurray, you know, fly and fly out and a job here in Calgary, and then that looks and, and you can see the history on um, the ATS system, on, on the ones that I've used, you can see the history um, and the candidates, uh, their, their application history. So you really want to be targeting it to jobs that you can do and that, that you want to do and not just, I want to work at some course, so I'm going to apply for every single thing that they call me. Because that's probably once they see five or ten different applications, they're going to say, mm, I don't really know how interested uh, in, in, in this job maybe or not, right? Because you're looking, when as a recruiter, you're looking for somebody who's going to stick around, at least for a couple of years. That's usually what you're looking for. I'll give you an example. It's exactly like gaming. If I went to you, I'd like to gaming. And only you. I'm very interested in you. And then you go, mm -hmm. how about you? I'd like to gaming you too. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Hey, I'll, I'll go into gaming. <laughs> Yes. Yes. I mean, the prerequisites listed in the, in the, in the job. 
job posting you want this 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 and this absolutely you've got two of them yeah absolutely not five absolutely what else what else helps you get uh get to that next step be seen and recognized as as a potential candidate for the role having your keywords yeah keywords is great what about for a person reviewing your resume uh, reviewing your resume if if you send if there's a careers email address, and you send it directly to careers at abccorp.com, and on reviewing the resumes, what do you think is going to get you seen and moved on to that next step? Absolutely. You know, white space and, Absolutely. How easy I can get that Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So something that's clean and easy to read and, and uh, isn't wonky. And, and yes, yes so I, I guess it depends on if the recruiter mm -hmm. reads the covers or not, if they're a person who would include right. them. But trying to show that you research the company yes. in your cover so that they actually know that you understand what it's Yes. And that's a good point. Um, I find that recruiters are torn. It's a kind of a 50 50 thing on if they read cover letters or not, um, and if they are a required part of the application or not. Um, I'm not some, someone who's big on cover letters, but something that I, if you do attach your cover letter as part of your resume as one document, um, make sure that you, and we'll talk about it a little bit, but this is where accuracy is key. And when you're talking about a company um, and why you want to work there, Make sure that it's the right company. <laughs> because I see that all the time. People forget to change the name of the company. You're, they're applying for a job at Burger King and they're saying how badly they want to work at McDonald's. Like that is just not a good thing ever. And that might get you screened out, right? So it's that attention to detail, that accuracy piece. So a lot of these things were mentioned. A clean and easy to read resume is number one. Um, you. Don't have long to catch the recruiter's attention. You said earlier six seconds. You have a little bit longer than six seconds, but not much longer than a minute. A recruiter isn't going to spend time looking for the information that they need. If they can't see it displayed prominently and, and easy to read, they're going to move on to that next one. So as, as a person on a piece of paper, you really don't have very much time at all to capture the attention. So, Education, experience, as you said, do you have the right profile for this role? And you want to be displaying that prominently. Um, no longer than two pages. That's kind of a, a thing that you're going to find is some recruiters differ on. But you don't, I don't like it any more than two. I saw a resume the other day that was nine pages long. I don't have time to read that. I don't have time to read that. Um, and and really, if, if you're applying to a, an email address, a career's email address, the person reviewing it may or may not be a technical expert for that role. Example, at some core, I recruited for engineers. I'm not an engineer. I, did, I don't have my own ring, and I don't want to be an engineer. Um, but I do know the required skill set that the hiring manager was looking for and what they needed. So. Um, really to get your resume seen. I don't, I don't have time to read nine pages, and I don't understand nine pages of engineering talk. I, I just don't, and I never will. So you want to make it, um, I, I guess, dumb it down a little bit. Take out your really, really technical examples, save them for an interview, and really just be including those key, key pieces that, that you need um, that you, and that are necessary for that role. Nobody needs a nine pages. Um, and again, as we spoke extensively about, take that time to personalize your resume. Um, the ATS looks for similar language, and there's an increased likelihood that you'll be ranked higher. And uh, it's, uh, prominently displaying your education and experience. If you want to bold it, then, then go ahead and do that. I want to see where a person worked, for how long, what their title was, and a bulleted list of what they did, what they were responsible for. Um, those are really the key pieces of the job. Not too much else matters outside of that. Um, and then a professional presentation. As I said, and we said too, no titles. All of the things I mentioned before,
for are things that are going to get you screened in in a positive way. And the typos and the profession, the mistakes in the company name, those will get you screened out. And, and it, it really, those are three second fixes that don't take long, but they do require attention to detail. So have a second look before you apply. Have a third look, have a fourth look. If it's a job that you really, really want, and if something is squiggly underlined in red, and you swear it's spelled right, and it's not just the Canadian way to spell it, um, I would Google it and just make sure. Because I've seen a lot of times people are they're certain that they spelled the word right, and it's spelled incorrectly, and they're screened out. Right? Especially if it's a role that requires attention to detail. Right? Those are really easy fixes. Um, okay, so the next step, you got, you have been screened through the ATS or by a person or a recruiter, and you're now at the pre-screen interview stage. So I like to talk and engage with a maximum of 10 candidates. These are our top 10 for the role. And I mean, depending on how many resumes we've, we've gotten, it may be more, a little bit more or a little bit less, but generally around that 10. And what a pre-screen interview is, is a brief conversation with the candidate to make sure that they can do everything that they said that they've done on their resume and get a better feel for how they present um, as a person and not a piece of paper. So um, my, my tips here, um, and probably the best tip I got, when I was in university, I had a prof say to me, when you're, you're all graduating soon, when you're looking for a job, don't answer the phone if you're waking up. If, if your phone rings and it wakes you up for whatever reason, you're unemployed and you slept in late, you're having that, don't answer the phone. And it has that has rang true for me so many times at um, in all of my roles. I recruit for a job, I call the person, they've just woken up, they're foggy, they don't know what's going on, they can't talk about the job, and I'm like, why did I even call this person? They're not a good fit right now. So just let it go to voicemail. I know everybody likes to or hates to pick up voicemails. They're annoying. Just text me, right? But uh, let it go to voicemail, and that gives you a cheat because if they leave a voicemail and they do want to pre-screen you, it gives you some time to do some research. Go look at the job posting again if you can find it and, and read through it. Compare it to your resume and think of some examples of how your experience will is a good match for that role. And do some research on the company. What's it like to work there? Who do you know that works there? Just, just do a little bit of that research. It doesn't have to be extensive, but you can take 10 or 15 minutes to do that. That way, when you call the recruiter back, you're ready to have that conversation. And, and, and you appear engaged, you're prepared, you not only want that job, you want to work at that company, and, and you know how your profile fits. One of the worst things to hear as a recruiter is to say, why did you apply for this job? And people say, ooh, uh, I've applied for like 50 jobs. Can you tell me about this one again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this is the role. This is where it is. You obviously don't want it that badly. So, and so those are really. And one yeah. thing more, we actually don't want to say that, but there is no option for us. Right. So if you see a number on your phone that you don't know, let it go to voicemail, and then that way you can go. That way you can research. I, I understand that the reality is is that you're probably applying for a lot of jobs if you're looking, but it does not sound good when you say that, right? So just, if you're searching for a job, let it go to voicemail. Pick it up when it gets there, um, and then you can do your research. Well, I don't think it's inappropriate that I would accept a screening call. I would not take a call. I would take the call and somebody said, do you have a call? Right, I don't and, think and you appropriate to put me on the spot. Right, and say, well, I don't do my screening. Well, I yeah. think there's professional ways to respond to that. Right, I absolutely. Say, I wouldn't do it. I say, well, I'm not really prepared right now. I'm just off to a meeting in five minutes. I think you can do and there's that. nothing wrong with saying that. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. Definitely, because I can't. Do that. Well, I would not feel know. special that you didn't drop everything for me. <laughs> right, just, <laughs> just, <laughs> just say. And I will keep a journal. Uh, I recommend to all people who are looking for jobs, keep a journal of every single position you've applied, uh, name, position, resume, that sort of thing, for two reasons. One, keeping a record for yourself. Two, for self-esteem when you go, I've applied everywhere, and you look that you've applied to five places in two months. That's not everywhere, yeah. right? So it gives you a reality check as well. And actually, as someone
top 10, maybe 12, and then from there, screening them down even further to come in for that in-person interview. When you get a pre-screen, you're not guaranteed an in-person. So this, this is your foot in the door, right? You want to keep getting your foot further and further in the door. And in order to do that, you have to prep and you have to be engaged. Because if you're not an engaged candidate and you say, hmm, I've applied for like 50 jobs, I don't know, can you tell me about it? Then I'm, you're probably not going to get a call for that interview. And, and be prepared to answer questions about your education, your experience, how it fits with the role. I always tell my friends when they're, or people that I work with for outplacement, is print off the job posting that you're applying for. It, you might have a stack of hundreds at the end of it, but then that way you have it, because some they have a way of just disappearing sometimes into the internet. They're gone off the ATX, you can't find them anymore, and, and you want to be prepared. So when you, when you do get that call for that pre-screen, to schedule that pre-screen, then that's when you go into your research, look at the job posting, see how your experience compares, be ready to answer questions, be ready to answer your interest in the role, not even in just the role, but the organization. Have an answer ready for that. And then everybody's favorite question is salary expectations one as well. Um, and, and people, I mean, 80% of the people I interview always hesitate to answer that question. Um, and, and really, that's the best fit for, for you and how you want to answer it. If you have a range that you, you would like to make, um, then and, and sometimes they really do push you to give you kind of a ballpark. And I would, I would caution you not to price yourself out, but don't lowball yourself either. And, and the politically correct way to answer that question is, you know, in my last position, I was making $75,000, but I'm very interested in this role. I think this is a great company. You've got a great brand, and I've heard really great things. I'd be negotiable depending on um, learning a little bit more about the opportunity and what it involves and, and, and working for this particular company. You know, so you can be a little bit PC there um, without pricing yourself out. Um, I mean, there are going to be people who say, I want $100,000, and you know, I'll, usually recruiters can be honest. That's just not where we're at. This is kind of more what we're talking about. But it's just an initial, at, at the pre-screen stage, it's just an initial range. Yes? I have calls yeah. during the pre-screen call that they specify the, the range about the salary. Yeah. Are you comfortable with this salary range? And that, then you can decide if you want yes. to proceed with that. With yes. That and, Canada, but, but yes. Well. and sometimes they'll disclose and sometimes they won't, right? And it, it, sometimes they'll tell you the range. Sometimes you can ask for it and they won't give it to you. But um, I, I would certainly ask or advise you to ask for it to make sure that you're not pricing yourself up. It's kind of a tricky game to play um, and it really is what feels best for you, for you and, and what you want to say. But if you have a number that you need to make, then then I would be honest about that too. Because the last thing you want to do is be engaged in this process for six weeks and then get to the end and be like, I would never work for that amount of money. You know, and then you've wasted everybody's time, you've wasted your time, and, and that's just not a fun thing. So if you've got a number that you need to make, then, then I'll just be honest. All right, so your foot is further in the door. You made it through the pre-screen interviews and you've got a call, you've got a call for an in-person interview. Um, and secure that face-to-face, -face, which is really what everybody's looking to do. Um, so I usually say out of the 10 candidates that we engage on the phone, well, we, we have the first one on your list. Right. Be on time. Right. Well, I forgot you guys had the slide. <laughs> 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 well, right. right. So professionalism is that key thing, right? Not only do you want to be on time, but you want to be a little bit early. But not so early that you get there an hour early and tell the receptionist that you're here. They call the recruiter and the recruiter is like, oh my God, I have another meeting before this interview, I'm not ready. Tell them to go get a coffee or something. So I, I usually say that 10 or 15 minutes. You can certainly arrive at the office earlier, park somewhere, go get a coffee, sit in your car and prep. But don't go into the lobby and tell the receptionist that you're there and, you know, until that 10 or 15 minutes before. Um, what else did you guys talk about? Any other anything else from my list? Well, from my slides, you can cheers. Basically, the person wouldn't have got the interview without having all the right stuff on. Right. And he got through the phone interview and so on and so on. So why, 
what am I looking for for that person sitting there? Are they going to be actually the cultural fit to come in? Absolutely. Do they have the personality that we're actually looking for to meld into our culture? Absolutely. It's, it's, as a candidate, it's your chance to show who you are authentically and, and who you are every day. Will you fit with the team? If there are other team members in on the interview, um, having a good back and forth, having a rapport, um, even just a quick back and forth, obviously, if you, you hit it off with them, it's not a guarantee, but it's always a positive that, that you do have that fit piece. Anything else? I think in terms of, I, I rarely do an interview by myself. Right. It's always, always a panel. Yes. And it may just be two people, but it may be five people or eight people right. in the hospital. Uh, right. But regardless, I've seen candidates who don't know how to, how to behave in a panel, and I don't mean um, professional. I just, they don't understand eye contact. And yes. If you ask the question, then you answer it. But right. you're also looking at the yes. people at the table and making sure that everybody's engaged. Yes, so that and active I've listening seen, piece and, yeah. and, and the, it, the engagement piece. Yeah, because I've seen candidates just can't even get near them. You're all the rest of you are sitting there. Like, as, as a recruiter, <laughs> yeah, as a recruiter, I had it where candidates come in and, well, actually, I did have one candidate say to me, well, you're just the recruiter. And he ignored me the whole time, gave eye contact to the hiring manager. The hiring manager was like, he was great. And I was like, are you kidding me? He was like, I don't even care. Even when I asked the question, he didn't engage me at all. So, I mean, you never want to tell somebody they're just anyone. So saying that is probably not a great thing. But that engagement piece, being engaging. The research that they've done beforehand, how engaged are they? The questions that they've asked. Their enthusiasm for the role in the organization. Those are all really good things that you want to be looking for. And, and as I sort of alluded to before, your situational questions, your VDI interview questions, your behavioral descriptive interview questions. So the theory behind those is that the best predictor of future performance is past performance. So these are all questions like everybody loves, tell me about a time when you were managing multiple priorities and deadlines, how did you keep yourself organized, um, what was the end result? So um, what the recruiter is looking for here is a complete answer of those question, of that question. There's a few questions within that question, but they're looking for the situation, your actions, and the results. And hopefully you're able to come up with positive examples because this is like, this is your uh, first impression, right? You want to be giving positive examples of your experience. Um, and, and the recruiter wants to see that those are all neatly connected. So, uh, and I've had this a lot, the way not to answer those questions. So the question that I just asked about multiple priorities and competing deadline. A lot of people say, huh, you know what, that happens every day. So um, I, I use my agenda and I, and I just make sure that I never miss a deadline. That's not what we want to see, we're looking for specifics. So um, generally I will probe more unless it's and then I will realize that this candidate doesn't know how to answer these kinds of questions. But we're, what a good way to answer that question is, you know what, that kind of happens every single day, but I'm going to give you an example. A couple weeks ago, I was especially busy. I had a deadline every single day. I was taking an online course. I had an exam in the middle of the week, and I was not um, uh, planning, helping with planning, a uh, family reunion on the weekend. So what I did, I, I went in every day, I wrote down my priorities, my list changed, but I was able to check off my accomplishments, stay on track, everything got in for deadline, I did well on my exam, and then I got to celebrate at the end of the week with a really great family reunion. That is the perfect way to answer those questions. You've got the situation, your actions, the result, and it's positive, right? You're, we're not looking for negative examples here. Um, so, so that's a BDI question. And, and a lot of times you can pull, um, you, you'll be able to pull what sorts of questions they're going to be asking from the job posting. If they're asking for um, uh, social skills or interpersonal skills, then they probably will ask you about a conflict situation. Um, if they're asking about um, attention to detail uh, if in the job posting, then they're likely going to ask you a situ situational question about attention to detail. So for your interview prep, think of examples, specific examples of when you utilize that particular skill and, and when you were successful, and you can bring that into the interview. Okay, so the reference check, we're almost done here. You've uh, made it through pre-screen, the in-person, and they've asked for your references. So not time to celebrate yet, you don't have a job offer in your hands. And what I'm seeing more and more of my clients do is check the references of more than one candidate. So you could be one of two or even three candidates that are at the end and, and they just can't bring themselves 
tell my friends and, and the people that I'm coaching for outplacement, don't just ask if somebody will be a reference. Ask them what they're going to say. Because not all references have positive things to say. Somebody might be too nice to say to you, no, I won't be a reference. But they're not too nice to say bad things about you in the reference chat. And that is a huge red flag. So just take that extra step. Please, will you be a reference for me? What will you say? If somebody calls you, what will you say about me in this capacity? What was I like to have, have work for, work for you? Um, what would you say about all of these things? And, and that way you know, and that, that way when they call your references, you're not shocked or caught off guard when we say bad things, or you don't get the job, right? So that's the important thing there. Um, and then the last thing here is the job offer and follow-up. We, we discussed follow-up a little bit earlier on. Um, but uh, organizations will usually wait until they have a signed offer till they notify their number two candidate. So if you're waiting kind of a long time, they keep saying they need more time, it's probably likely that you're a number two candidate. You may well end up getting a job offer if the number one doesn't accept, but if you're really finding that they're lagging, taking forever, that's probably where you're at. Um, and if you're not successful, ask the recruiter or the hiring manager who has contacted you for feedback. That's totally okay. Um, you might not. To be honest with you, most of the time the feedback that I give is about fit. And, and, and it's the hardest thing to hear because you're like, well, what am I supposed to do to be a better fit? What could I have done? And, and there's really nothing. There's no way to answer that question. It just comes down to the person who they are authentically and, and their skill set is just a better fit for that role. And so it's kind of hard feedback to hear, but I have given, uh, in my total disastrous interviews, I've had people, I, I have given feedback. Um, you know, you were prepared for the interview, you were very aggressive in asking questions, whatever that was. Um, you know, and, and to be honest with you, there's like, the, the thing to know is that there's one successful candidate out of hundreds or even a thousand applicants, right? There's one. So the pyramid just keeps getting smaller every level that you go up. You just want to be doing whatever you can to get to the top. And, and you may not be the right fit for that role, but everybody is happier when they're in the job that's the right fit. So a lot of the times, and I know it's especially hard right now in, in the economy, but I look back and when it didn't work out with jobs or whatever, there's usually some sort of revelation of why it wasn't a good fit. Maybe a little bit down the road, even though it was so hard to take. You're not, you're not, uh, you're not hired. The opposite of what Donald Trump says. So, <laughs> and then the last thing is, is just to keep at it. Like he said, searching for a job is a full-time job in itself, and it's a skill set. Interviewing and and uh, engaging with recruiters and knowing what the right things to say, it's a skill set. So just as you would work at your technical skill set in your career, you need to put some time into this. And, and, uh, and work towards it because you'll find yourself sitting in interviews after you've done five or ten and be like, oh, this is so much easier than it was before. Um, so it's a skill set that you have to work to remind you. Yes? That's a question. You sure can. Uh oh. They say you're not supposed to go back to the floor in 10 years on your resume. Right. Older, mature workers like myself. Right. They tell us over a time. Now, why is that? Because they assume we're going to retire. Well, and if they're in organization, they're going to be five years in. Well, as a complete aside, my dad had just celebrated his 30th anniversary with his organization. So it does happen. Right. But, 25 years right. But as, as Lisa said earlier, I don't like the black and whites. I don't like the other than the no more than two pages on your res uh, for your resume. But the black and whites to say, we only go through 30 candidates or only go back 10 years. If you have relevant experience, then you should be putting it on your resume. We don't want an all low. So if, if you have enough relevant experience from the last 10 years, then, then you can list that. Um, some hiring managers or recruiters might have more of a bias as far as when this person is going to retire or whatever. And, uh, but there's really no way to know who's going to be seeing that. At the end of the day, if somebody's looking for a career administrator, then, you know, if you only have 10 years, how are they supposed to know that, you know? 
And in, in that case, and for that role that I spoke about, where we did get 850 applicants, we've got 650 unread. I just heard from her manager, and she wants to she wants to hire again. Yeah, she wants to do another. She has another vacancy. Um, and so what I suggested to her is not go see again. We'll use those resumes that we have, right? Because we know it's a recent search. We know that they're active and interested, and and we don't need another 800 resumes, <laughs> right? Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'll talk to you in a Yeah, I'll talk to you in a So we are going to take uh, about a 10 minute break, and then we'll come back, and uh, Adam will take us into a different direction. And he has a few to do's to add, but I just want to address two points quickly. LinkedIn. LinkedIn should also be on your resume. I can tell you that as an HR manager, if I get an application, the first thing that I do, I go to LinkedIn. And I want to see you on LinkedIn. I mean, it's a reality. When LinkedIn came out 10 years ago, the US started to try to block uh, recruiters from using it as a screening tool in fee. So recruiters go to LinkedIn, and please don't have a blank picture. Because to go to Adam's analogy, I don't do blind dates. So I'm not talking about blind dates with you. I know. That is awesome. That is number one. Show me the smile. I want to know. So that is extremely important. And then we already talked. For those of us that are mature workers, prior experience also includes. It's two sentences. Two lines, actually. One sentence, two lines. Colon and the position. End of the story. If you're curious about it, you're going to ask me. But there's no point in trying to negate who we are. We have experience. If you want somebody to hit the ground running, you'll look at me. If you want somebody cheaper, you won't. So let's understand we're a commodity. Tip number three, and I think I mentioned it to Bonnie yesterday. 